Hello, and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's episode is an interview I did with Dr. Edward Buckingham. He's a facial plastic surgeon with a BA degree in accounting, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and he's in private practice in a gorgeous new office in Austin, Texas, which we will absolutely talk about. Now, Dr. Buckingham attended the University of Texas for his medical degree and his general surgery internship at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. Now, he then completed a fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery in Albany, New York. Now, he's won several awards for his academic achievements, as well as numerous publications and presentations, and he's been a guest instructor for the facial rejuvenation course given by the AAF PRS. He even has a wife who practices ophthalmology and oculoplastic surgery with the eye physicians of Austin. So he is knee deep above the neck surgery. So Dr. Buckingham, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's great to be here. I really appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, it's been a while since we've caught up. So I wanted to ask um, just a quick journey from how did you get from New York to Austin, Texas? Because I know you're not from there. Uh, I'm not from here. Um, as we mentioned, I'm from South Dakota, but I got to New York from Texas and back to Texas all because of that lovely wife of mine, Dawn. Uh, she's a ninth generation Texan, and there's no way you take the girl out of Texas. You can't take Texas out of the girl nor the girl out of Texas. It's all it's all a lie. It just goes both ways. So you, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, from South Dakota in Texas because my wife is from here, and it's a great, great spot to be. I couldn't be happier to be here, but it's all because of her. Nice. All right, because that has to be kind of a social um, change from South Dakota to Texas. Yeah, it, it is quite a bit of difference. Um, I got quite a shock. I went to SMU for my undergrad, so that was my first introduction to Texas, and I went straight from rural because everything in South Dakota is rural to Dallas, and SMU is not exactly the school for the poor. So I, it was it's quite the shock when I first went to SMU and. And then I met Dawn and she taught me some Texas manners. And so hopefully those are still kind of rubbing off a little bit. Oh, that's fantastic. So so do you like barbecue? I love barbecue and (laughs) and even more so Mexican food and margaritas. Nice, nice. Okay. So let's talk about when you came to Texas. Um, I I just love to hear how did you get to solo practice? Did you go direct directly into it? Did you join a multi-practice? What did you do? Um, I did. So as you mentioned, I did my fellowship with Ed Williams in Albany, and of course, he's a great entrepreneur. I know he's been on your show quite a bit and helped you yeah. with um, with all kinds of things. And so he really was instrumental in giving me that kind of added benefit on top of my already accounting degree and my business knowledge. And because I had the benefit of a wife who was joining a single specialty ophthalmology group, we were able to support ourselves financially. So that gave me the opportunity to just hang a shingle, which is what I always wanted to do. So I went straight from fellowship. Austin and basically just started practice from scratch. No kidding. Um, I actually know your area well. I, ha- I used to have some real estate there and I sold at the wrong time, I might add, but that's another story. Um, so, I mean, Austin just took off. How long were you in practice before you saw the surge of Austin? Did you know Austin was going to be what it is today? Or I mean, Austin has always been popular and growing, but I also lived back here in the 90s, and my wife has lived here since about 1976 or so, mm-hmm. and so it went from a 300-person town, 300,000-person town to around 2 million now, and it was probably 1-3 or so when I moved here, and it's just been growing exponentially, so I don't know that I anticipated the growth that was going to happen. We certainly knew it was growing, but we can't, again, we just came here. My wife graduated high school here. She has family here, so it was just more of picking a spot because of family reasons, more so than anticipating the business uh, possibilities and positiveness about that. But it turned out it turned out well. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> good point. And did you always do um, uh, reconstructive as well as cosmetic, or how how is that going to work out? The so that when you when you start a practice and you hang a shingle. You do everything you possibly can to earn any dime you can. So I did everything and anything. When I first started, I actually subleased space from my wife's ophthalmology practice two two half days a week in Austin because that's all the patients I had. I'd be lucky if I had one or two. And then I also had a space up in a small town called Lano, 
and one in a place called Horseshoe Bay, which are about 30 miles west of Austin and about 50 miles west of Austin, because there was a family medicine group up there that had about 18 doctors in it, and they didn't even have a dermatologist in town. And so I literally went up and did a day a week in those clinics, and they referred me anything uh, on anywhere that needed anything other than um, you know, skin related, other than the rash. So that was that's what I told them. I'm like, I'll do anything but a rash because I'm not a dermatologist. I don't know what to do. But if you've got a cyst or a lump or a bump or a lipoma or a cancer of any kind, I took anything and everything. And then I did a lot of shoe leather. I literally just went around and talked to dermatologists and most surgeons and just basically built a, a referral practice, just getting people to just send me a skin cancer here and there. And they would literally send me one and I'd do the repair and then they would figure figure out if I did a good job or not. And they'd be like, okay, he looks like he knows what he's doing. And they send me another one. And then soon enough, it became another one and another one and another one. And then from there, those patients turned into cosmetic patients. And so then the cosmetic side of things slowly grew. So I would say, you know, initially I did a whole lot of reconstructive work and or anything else that I could, you know, provide a good service for folks. Um, and then the, then the cosmetic side just slowly built from there. And now I do about 90% cosmetics and about 10% skin cancer reconstruction. But, and that's, and that's really all we do now uh, I, for, for me in particular is just aesthetics. And then the only thing non-aesthetic that I do is skin cancer reconstruction. Uh, we're going to talk about bringing on partners and things like that later, but I, I let my junior associate do some of that and I've got a fellowship too. And so the fellows do kind of the lumps and bumps now too, um, but I still really enjoy doing those reconstructions. So I continue to do that, even though I'm, 20 years in practice now and could easily kind of get rid of that. But I just, I choose not to. I say that I do facelifts to put my kids through college and I do skin cancer for my soul. <laughs> okay. Um, when, give me the time frame between the time you, like there's a grind to what you were doing. You've got three locations. They're 30 miles apart, 50 miles apart. How long did you do that? Um, I did the two satellite offices until I got busy enough whereby I could keep myself busy in Austin. And that took about four to five years. And then I slowly weaned away from doing those little satellite offices. But I hope people hear that because the a lot of the surgeons in today's world think they're going to jump right in. And I, I don't think you can do that. I think, I mean, it takes a minute to get your bearings and um, actually more than a minute. It takes years, <laughs> you know? It does. And it, it's interesting because obviously things were different when I started practice. I see we've actually had quite a few young surgeons move into Austin and mm -hmm. open and open practice for themselves. And they really hit the social media hard and kind of get referrals through that. And they become really a heavy injectable practice. I mean, when I when I started practice, Restylane wasn't even FDA approved yet. We had we had human collagen products. And so the injectable business was not what it is today. And so that that's what I see the young people doing now is they basically become injectors and then they convert those patients over to aesthetic patients at you know, surgical patients at some point but that and, and obviously i'm not in their practice i don't know that for a fact but um i don't do social media myself um i i just don't have time and i just don't enjoy it so um, but other people in my office will kind of follow those newer surgeons in town and that's kind of the impression that i get is that they're heavy injectors and then i'm sure they're getting into the surgical aspect as they get a little more mature no, I know several of them, and that's exactly what they've done. So whereas you did recon and got and like actually enhanced your surgical skills, they're actually going another route and doing social media and getting the non-surgical and then hopefully transitioning that to surgical. So there's no one way to do this is the point, you know? No, do, there's do, definitely do. not. You, you, you do anything you can to pay the bills and worry about worry about the rest later. You're right. The building that you just left. The, uh, that was super nice building, super nice neighborhood. Um, were you, how long had you been in that building? So I'm in my third, uh, oh. my third practice in Austin. Okay. Um, I, I leased space for about the first eight years and then ran out of space and then leased another space for another 10 years. And so 18 years in, well, it was really about 14 years in, I decided to actually look for land and start the architectural process and permitting process and all that to build the current building that I'm in. Um, but I had two previous leased spaces before that. So I've just, I just moved into this new building that you're referring to yeah. this last, last March. That is, that is, you know, my building that I own. So before you got to that big building, 
you had a pretty solid practice. Like what, what, what made up your practice? So I had about 3,500 square feet. I had a little office procedure room, but nothing that I could do level two anesthesia. In, so I was using a surgery center full time and it was just me and a nurse injector and a nurse doing lasers. And so that worked. And then I decided to bring in a junior associate and the timing was planned so that I would be moving into the new building as the junior associate came on. And th that timing was a little delayed because of construction delays. But we basically were just busting at the seams at the old space when you when you bring in. So now now I've got my junior associate, Dr. Aaron Smith, who's been with me about two and a half years. Uh, my current fellow, Hudson Fry, is going to be joining us and starting on uh, after his fellowship in August. And then I have three nurses who provide injectable and laser services. So the, there's really six providers in the office at this point, which obviously requires a little more space. And then in the new office, we also have two um, quad ASF accredited operating rooms and recovery space and all that too. So obviously that requires a bigger square foot um, space than just kind of doing what I was doing. Okay, you jumped. So what's the difference? Like, how did you get to that point where you said, okay, I only have like one nurse injector in me making money. And now I've decided to go big. What's the mindset there? And how much, um, how much um, fear, <laughs> um, you know, excitement goes into that? Because that's a big decision to make. How do you make that decision to really jump like you did? Yeah, I mean, the, the nurses, I mean, my nurse Renee has been with me 16 years. And I, I brought her on and introduced her into beginning to do that just basically when I got busy enough that I didn't want to be doing the injectable part of stuff. And so I started passing that on to her so I could spend more time doing surgical stuff. And and when and she came on 16 years ago as a clinic nurse and then a few years after that transition. So but basically she transitioned into doing injectables when I got to the point where I couldn't accommodate everybody who wanted to do injectables with me in a timely fashion. So that kind of grew. And that and that's basically how we determine when we're going to transition to new nurse. So I bring in nurses to clinical practice because they need to learn about facelifts and skin care and taking care of post-op patients and understanding what a patient is talking about when they say they have head, you know, heavy eyelids and just facial aesthetics in general. So I'm, I believe that a nurse needs to spend some time learning that prior to being allowed to move into the actual aesthetic provider world. And so we convert nurses who are been in our clinical practice uh, into first doing lasers, then neuromodulators, and then fillers as we get um, basically just busy enough to to warrant that. So uh, right now we've got, you know, Renee who only does neuromodulators and fillers. And then I've got another nurse, Sarah, who does um, some lasers and she does neuromodulators and a little bit of kind of introductory fillers. And then I have a third nurse who's the newest one in and she's basically only doing lasers at this point. But as the other one gets busier and we have more people, then she'll transition the neuromodulators and fillers, and then we'll backfill behind her, hopefully someday with the fourth uh, individual doing that. Um, so that's how we kind of handle the decisions on doing the nursing, the, the ancillary non-physician providers. As far as bringing on a junior associate, it's part of an exit plan um, to bring somebody in. And I know you want to talk more about that. So I don't want to spill the beans on that too much. I'll let you uh, bring the questions forward on that. Um, but essentially, you know, my clinic is booked until, well, right right now, if you just call up and want an appointment with me, and I, I don't mean to be braggadocious here, so I don't, please, please don't, it's just making a point, but um, my first available clinic is in, the clinic appointment's in December right now, and so, and, it, and it's been six to eight months booked out for quite some time, so you have to think at some point that you're losing patients because they're not going to wait six months to see you, and so you can either let them go to somebody else in town or you can bring somebody else in to see them. And I, I probably waited perhaps a little too long to do that, but it just, you, you have other influences in your life and decisions going on that make you kind of figure out when you're going to do it. And so, you know, we did it, like I said, about three years ago is when we really started um, looking or three and a half years. And then Aaron's been with me for about two and a half years um, and, it, and it's worked out great. So she's, uh, she's really busy and doing well and getting busier all the time. And I think that, when she rolled right in, just because I basically, and I, know, and I know some surgeons structure this differently. They bring in junior associates and they say, here, you do all the insurance work. I'm doing all the cosmetic work. I don't think that that's really a fair arrangement. Um, they need to be able to generate you know, re good revenue and do what they can do too. So basically anybody who calls our office for a, uh, a cosmetic appointment, we offer them myself or Aaron. And if they don't 
specifically want me, we encourage them to see Erin because her clinic schedule is more open than mine. And that's allowed her to get really busy. I think she did 50 or 60 facelifts her first year in practice with us. Nice. And is there a different price tiering structure for you versus her? No, you know, I don't want to give the impression that she's somehow an inferior surgeon to me. And I know that there's, it could be some differences in opinion to say, you know, look, you've been in practice 20 years and everybody knows you, so you should charge more. But we talked about it. And between just the two of us making a decision, we didn't feel like there was anything inferior in her quality. She's an excellent surgeon and has great training. And so we, we charge exactly the same. Um, uh, just my two cents. I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it as there's premium pricing to get somebody like you who's got the experience. Um, and it's just, if you, if you want to wait and pay more, you know, for the experience, go with Dr. B. If you're in a hurry um, and price is an option or price is an objective, um, then go with plan B. I, I personally like to give the patients a choice, but it's sold as if you want premier, you know, Aaron's great, but if you want the guy, <laughs> you're going to have to wait for him and pay more. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's probably good advice. I'll uh, I'll take that to our next manager's meeting and see what everybody has to say about that. It's not saying she's mediocre. It's saying you're the best and you pay <laughs> extra and wait for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, any staff tips, because you've had a lot of staff, um, like everybody, you know, um, any, any tips on, especially when you're hiring nurses, any tips on how you're finding them and um, keeping them motivated? Because nurses can be a little on the touchy side. Um, once they're around for a while and they start thinking they have a following and it's all about them. Have you had any of those issues? So, so you are referring to the nurse injectors then? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, first of all, they have a non-compete and so they can't just leave, which is important, uh, you know, in any situation where you've done, and again, I'm not bringing in a nurse injector who's fully trained and, and doing her own thing. And she just comes and joins my practice. I'm taking somebody who's never injected anything in their life and training them up myself. And so that, that is important for allowing a non-compete to stick is that you have to actually have provided some training that they couldn't have gotten elsewhere that, that makes them beholden to you to some degree. So not that they couldn't leave and, and go outside the radius of the non-compete or move wherever they want to. So that's just a, that's just a part of it. Um, the other part of it is just treating them really well, both treating them well as far as, you know, just personally and making a friendly, fun environment and, and being a good boss, um, but also treating them well financially. So I don't know that my nurse injector could go out on her own and make you know more than what, what I'm paying her. I mean, I'm, I've got the building and the advertising and cover everything else. And she's paid a base hourly wage as well as a pretty generous commission. And she brings home you know six figures in a good way. And I think that's that's a pretty good number. So I think that they don't want, they don't want to leave. They they're, they're in a great work environment. They've got great support staff. It's a fun office. We have a lot of fun and they're financially rewarded in such a way that they have no motivation to leave. What, how do you have fun? I keep saying to the practices in today's world, it can't be all stress. You know, it just can't be all, um, a lot of patients or a lot of people don't want to deal with the stress anymore. They want their life fun, especially like some of the younger people. Um, I came from a big strong work ethic from the Midwest. And it, we weren't, we weren't there for fun. <laughs> we were there for work. Um, and it seems like that has changed a bit. Like, what do you do for fun? I always say, well, I'll have a taco truck pull up if everyone reached the goal that month. Like any ideas there? You know, it, it's not that we do necessarily anything special to have fun. Mm -hmm. We just have fun. I mean, we encourage people to laugh and enjoy their work environment. Patients frequently comment because they'll, they'll be in a room and we'll be doing some stitch removal or doing a dressing change or something like that. And they'll just be staff members outside the door just cracking up. And I think that there are some people who would who would be like, wow, you know, you guys tone it down a little bit. Um, but patients love it. We just we just encourage it. And so we just we just joke and laugh and have fun. Our staff has a great relationship with each other. I mean, just this past weekend, uh, about seven or eight of them all went out on a boat after work on Friday. And just, you know, they just enjoy each other's company. So uh, it's not that we, it's not that we do anything specific. We just encourage a fun work environment. And it, it, a lot of it has to do with just the people. I don't, I don't think that that's something that you just flip a switch and bring on overnight. It's a slow, steady process and bringing in good people and keeping good people and getting rid of, of grumpy people and just encouraging that culture. And that, that's really what it's all about. Not that we don't 
do other things. I mean, I, we used to do lunch for a staff, for example, uh, when they were having a birthday. And it just it became expected that they're like, oh, it's my birthday. We're going to do lunch. And granted, when you go from 12 employees to 24, that gets to be a lot of lunches. Um, and so we changed that where we probably do more times that I bring in lunch than not. But it's always a surprise. Um, mm-hmm. We just we just the day before we just say, hey, Dr. Buckingham's buying, you know, barbecue for lunch tomorrow or whatever it is. And and then we just, you know, same thing because our office hours, we close the office at noon on Friday. Um, and so that that allows people to do some of the things that they need to do, like go to the bank and get a haircut and go to doctor's appointments and things like that. And so they really, and it also enjoys us to just every now and then, uh, we'll just say, you know, hey, we're going to go to the, the local wine bar and hang out for a couple hours and, you know, tabs on Buckingham Center. And the staff love that. We just go enjoy each other's company and I pay for some drinks and make sure everybody gets home safe. I love the idea about Friday um, shutting down earlier. I used to say, oh, but you're going to miss a bunch of patients. And I've, I've done mystery shopping forever. And frankly, Fridays are, um, they're quieter. So why not? Why? I mean, that's a great perk. And you don't have to disrupt the the regular working day. You know, it's just they, they get to leave early to run errands. I, I love that idea. Well, and we and we start our office at seven thirty every day too. So I never understood why we start surgery at seven thirty and clinic at nine. Um, so we start every day, uh, whether it's clinic or the operating room at seven thirty, and then we see our last patient at four. And I I don't personally eat lunch, so we don't take we don't close the office for lunch at all. We just rotate staff through, and they get to go take their lunch break while we're working. And so that allows me to be you know ultra efficient, and we just rock and roll all day long and keep it going and. That way we get to work before Austin traffic gets too crazy and hopefully leave before Austin traffic gets too crazy. Now, operative days go past four, but the uh, but the clinic closes at four. So operative days, you got to do what you do. If you got surgery that ends at five or six, um, you just do that. But I also don't believe in operating till nine. I know some folks are just, they'll book surgery till nine or 10 o'clock at night and just work, 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 work. Um, I just, I don't have it in me. I, I enjoy my personal life too much. For sure. I'm um, talking about Austin traffic. I remember um, when I first get, but like I was there 10 years ago or something. And I remember saying to my boyfriend, what are they going to do if, with all this traffic? Like there are no highways, there's no buses, there's no trains. Like, uh, is there any plan? By the way, is there any plan for <laughs> infrastructure? Um, I didn't- they, they, are, they are talking about light rail. It is extremely expensive. And you can't just put tunnels and subways in Austin, Texas. The entire ground is rock. And so, I mean, you could, but it would be dynamiting underneath city blocks in order to accomplish that. I'm not sure that that's such a great plan. So they're talking about putting in some above ground light rail, but mostly just expanding roads and doing what they can. But yeah, it's it's a little bit of a problem. We have, as you know, rivers and, and well, what they call lakes. Um, which in coming from you know the mountain area, this wouldn't be a lake. It'd just be a little bit wider river. Right. Um, but, we, but we call them lakes around here. Yeah. Um, but there's multiple water crossings. And so that, you know, obviously is an issue with traffic too, because you have to build big, giant, wide bridges to accommodate that. And that just gets tricky. So um, it, it, it's, it's a problem and it's not uh, progressing as quickly as anybody, I think, who lives here would like for it to be progressing. For sure. Um, well, I know half of California moved there and I remember there was a saying that said, don't buy Texas real estate with California eyes. And that because the real estate was so different. Now you guys are catching up to California prices. So things have changed a lot. Um, So let's talk about your new building, because that was um, a really big commitment you made. But you have that accounting degree. So I'll bet that helped you crunch the numbers to decide how you want to do that. How far is your new your brand new gorgeous building from your previous building? Uh, only about three miles. We we oh. if, if you yeah we we've stayed in basically the rolling wood Westlake Hills area, which I know you're a little great familiar. area. So yeah, it's it's on the west side of town. It's in the kind of horseshoe of the median income being where it needs to be. So that's where we kind of have, have stayed. So yeah, I mean, I basically just knew that I needed quite a bit more space, and I always wanted to bring my operating rooms in house. And so when I was about five years into my previous 10-year lease, I just started looking for land and then found basically the last piece of land that was kind of near 360, which is considered kind of the inner inner part of the Westlake area. 
and got that land under contract and did our due diligence as far as understanding what the impervious cover is and how big of a building we could build. And we went through the architectural schematics of multiple different designs and decided on something that was just ground parking and smaller because we looked at doing an even bigger building with uh, the first couple floors of being structured parking. Um, I had a building consultant who assisted with, you know, kind of understanding he knew what it would cost to do structured parking versus doing surface parking and what the square footage of the building would be. And we crunched the numbers to determine what maybe rental rates would be with that additional square foot, with the additional cost of structured parking, and just settled on a smaller uh, building with surface parking. But but you're exactly right. You just do that. You just you know crunch the numbers. And even with my accounting degree, I don't know that I know enough about doing that sort of number crunching because not only do you need to be able to do that, but you have to understand that if you build a parking garage that's two stories and X number of square feet, that it's going to be about this amount per square foot to build it. And then you have to extrapolate and take those numbers from there. So it's really, you really need a consultant to kind of help you with that sort of stuff. For sure. Um, just give me some of the mistakes made that others could learn from. Huh. In, in, in regards to what, the building? The construction, All right. Um, well, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, we we still, even though we've been in the building for a year, have not finished our punch list. And I, I don't want to go into too much of it because I'm trying to keep this a happy conversation. But <laughs> we're uh, we're having significant issues with our general contractor. Our general contractor is having significant significant financial issues, uh, as it is sometimes in the construction world when interest rates go up. You've got yourself over leveraged and extended, and all of a sudden you get yourself in trouble. And and our contractor has gotten himself in trouble. So um, so we've got you know, some subs that haven't been paid and some liens and there's lawyers involved. And so uh, I guess if you take hindsight in consideration, I would say hire a really experienced general contractor that you know is going to be in business and is going to be able to weather the storm. And even if it costs you a little bit more, it's probably worth it. Um, even though I didn't necessarily go with the low cost general contractor. And when I hired him, he was in, in great financial shape and seemed like the best decision to be made. But I think that you know, from a building standpoint, at this point in time, that that was the the biggest issue. And then, but that that's a hindsight issue, and that that was just a decision that could have been better. I think that the other advice I would give is that we had a really extended time frame for permitting, and it was because of a intrinsic property issue whereby we had a couple of different watersheds in the property, and we didn't have any zoning in the city of Austin to accommodate for those two separate water watersheds. And so the city just didn't do anything. They just sat on the plans and said, well, we don't have any zoning for this, so we're just going to sit on these and not do anything. Um, and I, being naive, just felt like they were just being slow. It didn't occur to me to hire an attorney who had inside leverage with the city to push the process along. So that's what we finally ended up doing is I hired a real estate attorney who's been in Austin for a long time and has pull. And we went down and met with the city and actually got them because they weren't even telling us that this is the issue. They just they just weren't doing anything. And so we finally all sat down in the room and they said, well, this is the issue. And we were able to come to a pretty quick resolution and, and get permitting on the road. So I think that that would be the, the thing that I would tell people is that if things don't seem like they're moving, find an attorney who has leverage within the within your system and push it along. And who's played the game before and knows who to go to to get things done. Um, how, because I know the last time I saw you at a meeting, everything was delayed, 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 the permits. Um, how long did it take you to actually go from, I guess, ground to up and running? So from breaking ground up and running, mm -hmm. it's probably two to two and a half years. Again, patience. You need some patience. That you have to really allow for these time delays, right? You do. When I started the process and the permitting and construction, I had about five years left in my lease when I was looking for land. And so we actually a little bit, sorry about the background noise a little bit. I'm at the, at the surgery center because I was doing skin cancer. And so we got the cleaning crew kind of rolling in. Great. Um, so anyway, but um, uh, but I thought that my biggest problem was going to be that I was going to have to find a, a sublease to fill my, right. my space. And I would definitely err on the side of knowing that you might have to either pay double rent or find a, a subtenant to sublease. Because as it ended up, I ended up holding over on my lease for about four and a half or five months. And literally, I mean, I, I had the ability to stay as long as I wanted to, but my my landlord was none too pleased. 
And so it, it got a little bit contentious at the end. And, and basically we got, <laughs> we literally got out of our old lease space and we're supposed to be moving into the same buildings, into our new building simultaneously. And as it turned out, we didn't have a certificate of occupancy from the fire marshal to get into the new building. And so for a week, I I just saw post-op patients and one of my general, uh, in one of the plastic surgeons in town, who's a colleague, just saw patients who needed to be seen in his office and her office. And then we got, finally a week later, got our TO and actually were able to move in. It was a little, little stressful. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, but now that you're in, how many square feet did you go in? So our we we occupy the first floor of the building. So the first floor is 7,500 square feet, but there is there is some common area for stairs and elevators. So the actual space that we occupy is around 6,900, right around 7,000. And then the building has got two stories. So the upstairs is tenant space that'll is is in the process of being built out because of course it's nice to have some money being generated for a building that you own that isn't just being generated by you. Right. Plus but then don't don't you have to um what do you call it when you have tenants come in and you have to rearrange things? What do you call that? Uh retrofit it or something for the tenant? Oh well you you have to do the the build out. I mean it's just shell space and so right. And and there's a couple ways you can have a tenant that comes in and they're like, yeah, I like shelf space. Just give me some tenant improvement dollars, and they just kind of take that money and do the real build out. Uh, we we looked at that for a while, and we weren't getting anybody to really bite. And so we actually did the architectural plans, and we're in the process of building out the top floor ourselves, and then just getting a tenant to come into the to the finished space. Um, and then of course, as we're in that process, we get a tenant come that comes along that wants to customize their space, and so. We're just actually signing a piece for somebody who's going to take what we did and undo some of it and do it on their own or whatever. So, anyway. But don't you have a say in that? Because they, you don't want them doing any crazy stuff upstairs, right? Oh, I absolutely have 100% say in what they do. I have 100% say in who's up there, uh, what kind of business they have. I mean, obviously, I don't get to control what business they have, but I get to control what businesses go up there and what their finish out looks like as far as the quality of what they're doing, all of that stuff. You bet I have 100% control um, over, over what goes on up there. So you have a nice exit strategy from what I can tell. You're now a landlord. <laughs> you have a beautiful practice where you can bring on more providers, more revenue generating providers. Okay. Um, do you have, a, I, know, I know you do, you have an exit strategy. I don't know how far out it is. I mean, are you, are you like winding down or are you just getting started? Um, I am. I am steady right now. I don't have any plans to wind down in the next year or two or so. Um, so nothing's really firm on the horizon, but, um, but yes. So, and again, th this is different business models and different people have different opinions. I know multiple people who believe in separating out all of their business aspects. So they might have their operating rooms as one business and their uh, surgical practice as one business and their nurse injectors as one business and their Philosophy on that is to have multiple profit centers and multiple things to sale to sell. I basically looked at that and said that it doesn't really matter because your bottom line is your bottom line from business to business. And so you can take all of that money and put it in one bucket. And you look at your your EBITDA and your whatever X factor that is to sell that. And it is it is what it is. And so I chose to put all of my operating and revenue my nurse injector revenue, the surgeon revenue, everything all in one bucket. And then in my opinion, that makes it easier to bring on somebody who wants to buy in because they can see that there's all of this other revenue that's flowing to the bottom line that they don't currently get a piece of because they're not an owner. The only thing that the surgeon gets a piece of when they come into a practice typically is whatever percentage of, of money of their own money that they generate that you give them. So you have to have something else that they're not personally generating that's flowing to the bottom line to make it a reasonable situation where they want to buy in. So as I was bringing in um, my junior associate and I was talking to people ab about what they'd done, because I know there are multiple examples of bringing in junior associates and the junior associate says, I'm not going to buy in. It's not worth it. I'm leaving. I'm going to go open my own doors or do whatever I'm going to do. And it just doesn't work out. And so people told me, they're like, yeah, you can't just get a practice valuation and expect them to buy in. Um, and I disagree. And that's exactly what we did. We set parameters and and Erin came in and she did her two years and she got her board certification. And then we got a practice valuation and we said, hey, this is the number. And she said, great. And, and that's it. So she bought 20% of the practice uh, just about, well, 
middle of uh, March, we closed on that. So, and, and that'll be a great investment for her. There's obviously a lot of revenue that's being generated by other individuals and it goes to the bottom line and now she'll get 20% of all of that. And we, and she and I live by the same formula. So I think that you have to be fair with your junior. So just like when she came in and I said, look, I'm not going to do all the cosmetic and let you do all the recon. We're going to, we're going to let whatever comes in and wants to go to you, go to you. Cause I wanted her to be able to generate as much revenue as she possibly could, even though she gets obviously the lion's share of that. But now that she's bought in, I, I used to just take a salary and then whatever was left over, I just took draws whenever I wanted to, right? Because I owned 100%. Um, but obviously, when you bring in another owner, then that's not the case anymore. You have to split it with whatever ownership percentage they have. And so um, also to make it fair, I live by the same formula she does. So up to a certain revenue amount, I get 40% of what I bring in. Above the next threshold, I get 45, and above the next th threshold, I get 50, unless overhead's running more than 50%, and then it gets reduced down. But over a certain threshold, you get to you get to take home, you know, everything up to what the expenses are. So just like for her, part of her earnings are going to the bottom line. Same with me. I I part of my earnings are going to the bottom line. So she gets 20% of what goes to the bottom line that she generates and she gets 20% that goes to the bottom line for what I generate. So it's just a fair situation. We both get to benefit and it makes it enticing for somebody to want to buy in and feel like they're getting value for their money. And, and it allows me, I think, you know, I think the biggest problem that doctors do, and I'm not saying this is necessarily in the plastic surgery world, but you, know, you see doctors all the time who build this practice for their entire career for 35 or 40 years. And then they go, Oh, I'm ready to retire. I'm going to sell my practice. Well, it doesn't have any value if you sell it when you're gone. Your practice is your practice because of you and what you built. And so you have to bring in a junior associate and allow them to build their practice under your name and what everybody's doing to come in that they recognize how, how you know, good you are and let them build their practice with that. And you need to step away incrementally. It wouldn't also be fair for me to have Aaron buy it at 20% and then go, okay, hey, thanks so much for the 20%. I'm going to go work two days a week. That just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the philosophy, but as far as I, so I do, I do have a plan. Um, obviously I've got Dr. Fry who's um, starting up in August. And my, my hope is that he will be equally as successful and busy as Aaron was after two years. And then he'll want to buy in as well. And I'll let him buy in 20% as well. And then I figure sometime between 60 and 62, I'm, I'm about to be 55 now. So mm -hmm. sometime between 60 and 62, I'll probably start working a half a day a week less, and I might take a little bit more vacation. Um, but as long as I'm having fun, I'm planning on working until, what I don't want to be is the guy that the patient walks in the room and they go, wow, I heard he was the man, but I think he's probably a little too old now. I don't know, I don't know that he's got, I don't know that he's got the stuff anymore. I will not be that person. I'm not going to work till 75 or 80 and be that guy that, that, that people think has, have the tremor when they're trying to operate. Not for uh me. Yeah, I think it's a while before you get to that point. And um, there are still some surgeons, this is what they do. That I mean, they are going to die on the surgery table and they know it. Um, I think a lot of surgeons in today's world, though, are really trying to figure out, is that really what I want to do? But then they have to figure out how do, how do you um, pass your practice on to somebody else? So I like what you're doing. It's on you. Like, let's just go one step further. Let's say you brought on somebody else then. So you've got two associates at 20%, then you brought on another person at another 20%. Now you're like, is that the plan to keep giving people 20% or is it maxed out at the two? Or actually so, so I have a daughter who's a first year medical student ah. who is most likely, obviously she has a lot to go through before she determines what she wants to do. And then she still has to match into an ENT residency and a fellowship and all that sort of stuff. So there's hurdles there. But if you asked her today what she was going to do, she'd say that I'm going to do facial plastic surgery. And so so that's the plan um, is for her to potentially come in and be that next 20%. Mm -hmm. But I, I won't be in a situation where I don't have operational control from an ownership standpoint until I'm ready to say that, gee, if something happened, I would be ready to retire at this point. Mm -hmm. So because. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to have built the company and, and lose control from a voting shareholder standpoint. You know, the, 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 um, the nuance there is you're somebody who gets it. Like you understand the business and the marketing. 
And a lot of other surgeons don't want to, they're not interested in it. They, they're fine just being the associate forever. So is, are you tr- teaching them? Like Ed Williams was so good about teaching fellows, this is the business side. This is how you do it. Are you doing that as well and hoping one of them will, um, if you did want to step away, could they fill your shoes? Because you, those are big shoes to fill. Well, obviously not immediately, but I, I certainly anticipate that Aaron's going to get busier and busier. Her word of mouth referrals are going to get more and more. Uh, I assume that Dr. Fry is going to have the same sort of scenario where he'll be busier than most his first couple of years out. And then as he builds his practice and starts to build a clientele that come to him because he's such a nice guy and such a great surgeon that by the time they're in practice for 10 years, then yeah, my, they'll be able to fill my shoes. But there's no way that anybody's going to come into the practice and fill the shoes of a 20-year surgeon when they're in their first five years of practice. Um, it's going to take multiple years for them to build up and, and get to the point where they've got a waiting list for six months of people that want to come see them as well. It just, it just takes time. Right. But then who's going to, like, is it a democracy then? Is it a dictatorship? Because right now I would think you have the final say-so in the big decisions made. Um, when you have three people under you all at 20%, I just wonder how that works out when, um, with all the different personalities and egos. Does it work out well if you've got so. it set up straight? straight you know? So I don't, I don't think I answered your question on teaching fellows the business side of things, but 100% absolutely. I mean, we, we say that when the fellows come and interview with us is that one of the reasons why you would want to do this fellowship is because you'll actually learn the business aspect of medicine. We have a, a word doc document that basically says these are the things we expect you to know when you finish your fellowship and and half of that is clinical stuff and half of it is related to marketing and accounting and staff management and hr and every other thing you can think of as far as what it takes to run a practice and and i don't i don't hold them personally responsible from the standpoint that i go hey have you learned this yet hey have you learned that yet and i'm not going through checking the box i just give it to them and go look this is your responsibility to learn this stuff in your in your 12 months that you're here. If you don't do that, too bad on you. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be your parent. I'm not here to be your parent. I'm here to give you the opportunity to learn. And if you take the initiative to learn, you have every resource to be able to do that. Um, so that that is definitely part of it. But in, an, in answer to the other question, it, I, I don't know how, the, but, but it, it is not a dictatorship. Um, every month, we sit down and have the um, first Friday of the month in the morning, we have our manager's meeting. And I sit down with my HR, you know, practice manager person, my business manager, my nurse manager, the fellow, Aaron. And when Renee, who's my nurse injector, can be there, she's included too. So whatever number of people, six or seven people. And we sit down and we talk about stuff. And I definitely do not take a dictatorial attitude towards that. I think that everybody has positive, intelligent things to say and contribute to those meetings. And oftentimes I'll get four or five people who think that an idea is better than mine. And if, you know, and if I get that many people who think that they're right and they can convince me that they are, then we go that direction. Now, absolutely. Do I have veto power? You bet. I'm, I'm the president, the CEO, I'm in charge, but most of the time there's not anything that happens whereby I have to put my foot down and say, I know the rest of you want this, but we're not going to do this. Usually there's a pretty good consensus on most decisions. That's fantastic. And then let's switch over to marketing. Any marketing tips? I mean, you're in a pretty competitive area now. Um, any, any, anything you're doing to help you differentiate from everyone else? I mean, I have the advantage of word of mouth referrals. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how much of your practice do you think your personal practice would be word of mouth referral? 90% plus. And I'm going to tell you why, because, and I've watched you forever. Um, You used to send beautiful flowers to (laughs) facelift patients. And you, do you still do it? Absolutely. hundred percent. Everybody. I don't know why everybody doesn't do that. You've got so many notes and reviews and testimonials. And I think everyone was just so surprised they got flowers and they all, I mean, how great of a a strategy. And it's a, it's not even a strategy. Like you just know that's the right thing to do. Um, yeah. How much has that been worth to you? Oh, uh, immeasurable. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you're you're exactly right. We get comments all the time. They come in and they and well, of course they go, oh my gosh, my husband bought me flowers, and then and then of course they're like, oh, this is from Dr. Blackingham. <laughs> and their husbands are kind of like, oh man. Yeah. 
thanks, I thanks, dude. <laughs> I should have gotten your flowers, but nevertheless, it works. So, uh, so yeah, it, it and it's uh, and it's not overly expensive either. So it's a it's a really nice touch, and I, I look at it as you know when you're in that immediate post operative recovery period, you don't think yourself that you look very pretty. And right. so it's, it's nice to have something pretty and that smells good to kind of take your mind off of what you're going through. And it, it has definitely paid off um, immeasurably over the years. Patients, patients love it. Um, the secret is to get those there early on. Um, I once had a facelift and the flowers arrived um, 13 days later and it kind of defeated the purpose. I'm like, where have you been? You know? <laughs> so. yep. Well, it, it, it's crazy. I, long time belief that the flowers had to be delivered by a florist and we went through a bunch of florists and it just was really really difficult to get good quality flowers that got delivered in a timely fashion oh. and um so yeah now as crazy as it is we just do 1-800-flowers.com yeah. and and people love it because the flowers last for like 10 or 14 days right just you cannot get flowers that are that fresh I mean, I'm sure there are high-end florists who have amazingly fresh flowers, but when you're going straight from the supplier who's cutting whatever flower it is and putting it in a box and sending it, then mm -hmm. patients just say that they last forever. So as kind of not classy as it is to get flowers in a box in some way, shape, or form, having having really fresh flowers, is it makes up for it, in my opinion. Oh, it's so much fun. It's such a surprise. It's just lovely. I think it's a great idea, and I don't know why everyone doesn't do it. But what a great differentiator for you, you know? Um, now, I know you're not a big social media kind of guy. Are the younger folks in your office, uh, the associates, are they into it? Yeah, so so Dr. Smith has a social media account that's associated with the practice that that she runs and does. Uh, Air, uh, I'm sorry, Renee, my nurse injector, has her own social media that that she does. And then we have someone in the practice who does our social media. It's mm -hmm. just not me. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, again, I... I don't want to do it. I'm bad at it. I don't enjoy it. I don't spend any time on social media whatsoever. I have an Instagram page only because my son's baseball games were streamed on Instagram and I had to have one to watch his games. <laughs> I, it's just, it's not for me. Um, so, so yes, we're absolutely trying to leverage social media the best we can. I wouldn't say that it's the easiest thing in the world to do. And I still have my reservations as to how much business it actually generates. I'm sure it's one component where people see you're on see you on social media and then they talk to you know, whoever and then they go to your website and ultimately they get to you because of all of those factors and it's really kind of difficult to tell you know which one of those elements was the first one that really brought them into knowing into knowing you so we just look at it look at it as one piece of the pie that you have to do what you can to do the best you can but i certainly don't have a million followers right uh, no, I'm with you. If it's not, if you're not into it, I would say it's more important that you be genuine when you when you do do it. And if you can have a good marketing team that just shows you off in a great way where you're not <laughs> you're not doing the production, you know, it's just maybe they're catching you at the right times and showing the day in the life of a plastic surgeon. Um, that makes more sense. But if you're not into it, I I just I don't think it's if, I don't think it's worth your uh, uh, hours and hours spending on that. Um, it's amazing how some doctors spend two to four hours a day on it. Mm -hmm. I just don't get that. Yeah. Well, and it and again, I I am the of all the things we could talk about today, the one that I am the least authority on is probably social media. And so, but it seems to me like the doctors who are really popular on social media tend to have some sort of a flair to what they're doing. Um, and I am just a nuts and bolts kind of easy going, you know, grew up rural kind of guy. I just, I, I can't, I can't be Dr. Miami. Right. It would never, it would never work for me. So I, I just, I can't do it. So we try to, we try to provide some good content that's interesting to people that has our values embedded in it. And unfortunately it's just not that flashy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So give me like, what would you say is the biggest challenge running and growing a cosmetic practice today? HR. I hear that a lot. Always. Um, it is. And, and I, and I would say that that's probably the most valuable point that I can make in, in growing a practice is as soon as you get even a sniff that you have discontent or employees that are forming cliques, 
and talking badly about other employees, break it up, make sure it ends. And if it doesn't end, get rid of them because it does not take but a half a second for a rotten apple to make the rest of the office a rotten place. And, and I've probably been through two or three iterations of that where I had employees that began that sort of behavior and taking after other employees and creating a hostile work environment. And it, and it took me probably the third time before I actually started figuring out that you just have to have a absolutely zero tolerance policy for that. So, you know, knock on wood right now, we have a really good solid culture and everybody gets along and they're all team players and they are friendly to each other. But I tell you, just especially, especially the clicks, when you get two, when you get two people teaming up against another one, you, you just, you got to call them to the office immediately and just say, we don't, we're not going to tolerate this. Stop this behavior right now or you're gone. Good for you because that's exactly what happens. It, it, you can see it happening and you have a tendency to be too busy and not interested in it enough to get involved. And that's how it grows. And then you have a big problem on your hands. And by then, it's so toxic that you've lost some of the others in your in your practice who thought, no, I'm not working like this. So yeah, I hear you. HR has become an issue. So on the, on the more fun side, tell us something we don't know about you. So you already you already took the South Dakota. So <laughs> that I grew up in South Dakota. That's kind of boring, but but tell uh, us about South Dakota because I've never been there. Uh, so well, South Dakota, where I grew up in Rapid City, is an amazing place. Um, it's a about sixty five thousand people, so relatively rural, especially when you consider that the closest big town is Denver, which is about six hours away, and you're the second biggest town in the state. So it's it's big enough to have some some conveniences of being in a little bit of a city, but you're fifteen minutes from being out in the Black Hills where you can literally just kind of park your car on the side of the road and take off into the forest and never see anybody else. It's an, it's an amazing forest because it's an arid forest. And so there's not a lot of undergrowth. And so literally you don't even need a trail. You can just go, I want to head West and just go. And as long as you don't get lost and get yourself turned around, you, you'll get back to where you want to be. So it's, it's really, it was an amazing environment to grow up in. Um, really good, solid people, just beautiful country, tons of granite, obviously Mount Rushmore's there. Uh, so it was a really, really great place to grow up. The only problem with being a facial plastic surgeon there is you'd have to convince the goats and the cattle to have facelifts because there's not enough people. So, but, um, but Texas works out good for that. And I just get home, but I still have family that, that lives up there. My uh, sister and brother uh, live up there and my parents are there, but they don't winter there anymore. They're in their mid eighties and they don't like to drive in the snow anymore, so they go south for the winter. Nice. So, where, like, where would they go to Texas? <laughs> uh, no, I tried to get them to come to Texas, but they had all their friends were going to the Sun City area in Arizona, so they uh, so they went. Oh, there. that works. Arizona is beautiful in the winter time. It's brutal in the summer. Yeah, yeah. So, but the other the other thing you should know about me though is not really about me, but about my wife, because you said she was an ophthalmologist and oculoplastic surgeon, which is true. Um, but she left practice uh, a couple of months ago because she was elected for um, the Texas Land Commissioner. Oh, my God. Where was she when you needed help with your, your permits? <laughs> Believe me, she, she was the one who recruited the people that I needed help with the permits. Okay. But yeah. um, and unfortunately, government officials don't have that much power. But, oh. um, but yeah, so she's, she's a statewide elected official in Texas. Uh, oh she, runs, she runs about a $2.5 billion, 800-employee agency that does all kinds of things that I won't bore you with everything from uh, disaster recovery to running the Alamo and everything in between. So it's actually, uh, the office actually predates the governor in Texas. So, so she's, uh, yeah, she's pretty amazing. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Oh, well, congratulations. So you're, you're kind of living with a celebrity at this point. A little bit. Yes, ma'am. Can you yeah. still go to dinner without being, you know, in a restaurant without being interrupted? Um, no, not really. No I, mean, kidding. I mean, occasionally, but yeah, but, and, and most people are pretty, are pretty cool and respectful, but we definitely see people everywhere we go that, that she knows. And, and she, of course, wants to go up and shake hands and say hi and talk and everything too. But yeah, it's not uncommon for us to have a dinner that lasts an hour and a half and then walking around the restaurant saying hi to people for another hour afterwards. So uh, but, oh, that must be really fun for you. All yeah. right. <laughs> so, it, it all right. 
<laughs> Dr. Buckingham, it has been a pleasure having you on Beauty and the Biz. I'm so, um, I just have watched you for decades and you're just doing a killer job on the business side. Um, I'm, I, you know, congratulations on your new building. I know you've got that business plan. I know you've got an exit strategy that you're doing what you need to do. Terrific. And isn't your website buckinghamfacialplastics.com? Yes, that is got correct. It? Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. That's going to wrap it up for us today for Beauty in the Biz. Please do me a favor and subscribe if you haven't done so already, and a review would be terrific. And then if you've got any feedback or questions for me, please leave them at my website, which is katherinemaley.com, or you can certainly DM me on Instagram at katherinemaleymba. Thanks so much, and we'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.